Welcome back to The Wandering Samurai Study, in which we review and analyze every single act told in Rurouni Kenshin. So first and foremost, I want to say thank you to everybody who watched the first video and everyone who is clicking on the second video. If you've come from the first video and you're now moving into the second video, thank you. Thank you for deciding to join me on this journey. How long you decide to stay, it is completely up to you. I don't hold it against anybody. But nonetheless, I very much appreciate you. But if you're watching this video first and you haven't seen the first one, well then go and do that. <laughs> because this is talking about chapter two or act two of Rurouni Kenshin. And in that first video, we're talking about act one and the basic introduction of Rurouni Kenshin. Oh, and a couple last things that I want to say is that these videos are recorded in advance, so any suggestions and recommendations that you guys have for me uh, will be shown and, and listened to in a later video than this one exactly. Uh, I'm doing this to give myself a head start on uploading and editing and figuring out the routine that I'm going to have for this ser video series. Oh, and truly one last thing before we get started. I know that I made a lot of comparisons to the anime in chapter one, and I knew that I was doing that as I was recording and even in editing, I was like, well, I'm trying not to talk too much about the anime, uh, especially because this is what started it. The anime did not come first, and I am well aware of that. I, I, my wording, in that first video made it sound like the anime came first and then I was comparing it to the manga but n no I, I I know what's I know what's up <laughs> um, but I'll try not to make so many anime comparisons it's just that this story in particular is different from what the anime created uh, this is of course first but then when the anime came it had some loose liberties and I think that some of those liberties are worth mentioning and noting when talking about this series because a lot of people think that if they watch the anime they've seen they know the story and a lot of the times that isn't really the case so act two is called Rurouni in the city and this is basically episode three of the anime except with you know some minor changes Kaoru is wondering what is the deal with Kenshin? She knows that she doesn't want to pry, but she can't help herself wondering what is his deal? Why did he become a swordsman when most revolutionaries abandoned the sword and took up high power uh, government jobs in the Meiji government? What is his deal? <laughs> and we get that answer, of course. Well, one of the first things that I want to actually talk about is where Kaoru notices at the end of Act 1 that Kenshin has a very young face, but he was someone that participated in the Bakumatsu. Chapter 2 or Act 2 opens up with Kenshin answering that he is 28. Kaoru has a problem with this, and uh, I think it's really funny that Kenshin asks if it would help if he rounds up the number to uh, to age 30. <laughs> the whole deal with this chapter is bringing back the sword ban act that I mentioned in Act 1. Here we get a little bit more of this and we get an answer as to why Kenshin, uh, why Kenshin is actually allowed to freely wear the sword on him for the remainder of his time in Tokyo. Why it doesn't actually become an issue of him holding the sword until that gag joke that we see on his road to Kyoto. But here we are introduced to the policeman core, whereas in the anime, they came in episode three and the reason for them coming into the scene was because they were uh, going around causing trouble as these corrupt policemen hungry with power. Kaoru has a problem with Kenshin wearing his sword uh, outside and Kenshin is being very nonchalant about carrying it saying that it worked out the last time that he was walking around with the sword and that he wasn't actually arrested and he's sure that it'll work out again but this time around he is stopped again. The police swordsmen arrive uh, to make an example of Kenshin. The lead one is challenging him to a fight and Kenshin is not willing to open the sword. And this here is just another example of the new Meiji way of life. This story is very much commentary on how social norms were changed, how Japan became a much more 
mm, not so good place to live in. Though, I can imagine that living in Tokugawa and the Edo period was probably not as glamorous as it was. There was a feudal system from what I understand. Uh, but I can't imagine it being too much better here as well. Because here we have the policemen walking around ready to kill people. The lead being a former revolutionary explaining that he's willing to kill people at random just to keep his senses intact. And that just can't be good. That, that's just not something that should fly. While all of this is going on, there is the chief Yamagata who has come into town looking for Kenshin after the rumors of the Hitokiri Patosai making its way to his ear. Now, it's interesting enough that here, even in, in Act 2, we get an even better sense of Kenshin. That uh, Kenshin as a person who was in the revolution was not someone who was ever a person who killed for the sake of killing, who enjoyed it. He's always been this gentle soul. We have an explanation of Kenshin through the eyes of a former colleague during the revolution that, that he was always a person who used his sword in the name of the revolution. Uh, as someone whose soul should never be stained by the blood of the men that he's killed because he did it in the name of the new era that he was trying to create with the revolution. But I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself. It's just interesting though that when Yamagata is meeting with the police chief talking about the Hitokiri, uh, the Kamiya Kishin Hitokiri from the events of Act 1, we get an answer as to how the police knew about Kenshin's whereabouts. Uh, for one, they admit that the people that they arrested say that they were actually beat up by the real Hitokiri Patosai. Now the chief didn't actually believe it, uh, but Yamagata sensei actually knew what was up uh, or understood what was who it was because the their description or the rumored or the Kamea Kishin uh, Hitokiri did not fit the description that he knew of Kenshin. He always knew Kenshin as somebody who only killed when it was absolutely necessary and not for glory or for for fun. And so when one of the policemen come in and interrupt the meeting and describe Kenshin as having a, having a bout with the police swordsman and how he's the one that is winning and how Yamagata-san runs to the crime scene or to the scene and following the event of Kenshin fighting the police sword and uh, everybody cheering for Kenshin and making it obvious for the police to know who it was in the wrong, Kenshin clearly being a man of the people judging by the crowd and such uh, and that the police corps are uh, you know the ones in the wrong. My favorite part here and it's a scene that I really enjoy in the anime as well is when Yamagata tries to get Kenshin to enter the carriage. Uh, in this in this chapter it's actually so much more abrupt. It is uh, it is kind of like hey Kenshin do you want to get in the carriage we can talk and Kenshin's like no 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 and he just turns around and walks away. When Yamagata tries to get him to stop uh, Kenshin is just like, no, I'm I'm good, and just walks away. As I previously mentioned, though, Yamagata, a former colleague of Kenshin, knows exactly the type of person that he is. And he says that if anybody tries to give Kenshin any trouble, he will use his power to... And Kenshin interrupts him, saying, to shut them up, like this man tried to do with the crowd. It really just emphasizes Kenshin's character. It, it uh, If it was at all vague in the first act, it is very distinguished and very clear here that Kenshin is a person who is going to wander to protect the people around him. It's very easily stated in the, in the act as well. <laughs> But this entire chapter just serves to answer Kaoru's question of why it is that Kenshin still carries his sword and why uh, he doesn't give it up like all of these other men <clears throat> in the 
who are now p uh, people of the of the government. And one final thing before I close off is they actually explained during the Yamagata meeting how the government was set up through the revolutionaries and how they all broke out into different branches. One went into the military, one went into the police corps, one went into, uh, I don't remember the other ones at the top of my head. But it's interesting though, like how Watsuki has essentially given us history lessons sprinkled into the story itself and it's something that i very much appreciate as just a person who enjoys uh history and understanding little bits of aspects of how things came to be and so that's pretty much act two of Ruroni kenshin and the second episode of the wandering samurai study but for now i am going to close out this video and i will see you guys next week for uh chapter three or Act 3 of Rurouni Kenshin. But if you like this video, then please consider subscribing to the channel and comment down below what you thought of this chapter, what do you think of uh, chapter 1 and, and chapter 2, how the two blend together to uh, create this narrative that we are reading together. And we will talk in the comments, hopefully. Bye, John.